Hello, colleagues. Welcome to another episode of A Physician's Lens, a periodic conversation for physicians and other care providers across the HCA healthcare community discussing topics of uh, importance. I'm Dr. John Perlin, Chief Medical Officer and President of Clinical Operations for HCA Healthcare, and today I'm joined by our Senior Vice President for Government Relations, Jeff Cohen. Good morning, Jeff. It's great to have you with us. Thank you, Dr. Perlin. I'm delighted to be here. So, um, Jeff is a fairly new member of the team, maybe um, a little bit on your background. You've been uh, with us a few months, and, uh, but we've known you for a long time. Yeah, uh, that's right. So, I, am, I'm, I guess I'm 10 months in, uh, Dr. Perlin, uh, but I think it's about right. But I've been with HCA more or less about 20 years. So, prior to joining uh, HCA Healthcare, I was with the Federation of American Hospitals in Washington, D.C. I headed up their public affairs, which was their uh, head of their, their government affairs and their communications. So uh, the Federation is the trade association in Washington that represents HCA. So I was essentially the uh, head of the HCA's Washington office before I came to HCA. And now you'll see in this office, I'm actually here in Washington in HCA's new office. Uh, so I, I split my time between Washington and, and Nashville. Well, we're really glad to have you as part of the team. And uh, indeed, 10 months. Um... Uh, not very eventful. We've had an epidemic, epi economic collapse, and um, a national conversation on social justice. Uh, and these are big issues, and they're issues affecting not only the practice of um, uh, operations of hospital systems and healthcare like HCA, uh, but physician offices. And uh, we really appreciate your advocacy. So, Jeff, the CARES Act is um, incredibly familiar to um, uh, many of our physicians and, and care providers. They've used it to help keep uh, offices afloat, uh, et cetera. Tell us a little bit about what's coming up in terms of relief um, from the federal government and perhaps how that cascades uh, into states' activities. Yeah, great question, Dr. Perlin. So in terms of what's coming up, what we expect to see is a, a combination of uh, this is how legislating is done. It's a little bit of sausage making on Republicans getting something on liability reform and Democrats getting something on state bailout money. And then in between on health care, there's a lot of advocacy uh, concerning accelerated payments, concerning med, uh, coverage, support, COBRA support, that sort of stuff. So we would expect to see something coming together uh, concerning those issues. And that feeds in as well to the need to um, address as many as 38 million people who either are or will be losing their employer-sponsored health care insurance. It absolutely does. You know, right now, again, 40 million unemployed Americans. Uh, we believe there's 30 plus million of those who have uh, have the either have lost their coverage or, or potentially will lose their coverage. There could be many more that are currently furloughed that may ultimately end up uh, losing that coverage. So, you know, making sure that 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 those Americans that are are, are concerned about their health security right now have that kind of security and are, um, you know, or maybe have a bridge to that next job in terms of that healthcare, uh, having COBRA that they can afford or access to the exchanges uh, is really a huge priority for us. And we're delighted to partner with the physician community to, to get that done. Really appreciate your work in that. Um, as um, our good friend Chip Kahn says, uh, there's a series of hydraulics. Uh, we've got the Medicare patients, and uh, while the trust fund uh, is under pressure, we don't see any reduction in, in the reimbursement there. And indeed, the big questions are, will things like telehealth be permanently funded? You look at Medicaid, um, the pressure on the states uh, is brutal, uh, and um, that's too easy a target unless they get support. Uh, then we have the employer-sponsored insurance, which cross-subsidizes so much of, uh, of the underpayment, the systemic underpayment on the government side, as well as the uninsured. And so that loss of employer-sponsored insurance is a really tough one for physician practices. Uh, and um, on the patient perspective, uh, COBRA is really prohibitively expensive, particularly if you've just lost your job. People are pretty happy with their insurance. And I think we want to do everything we can to, to maintain that type of insurance if that's what they want. You know, uh, keeping their COBRA allows them to keep their doctor. Keeping that uh, their employer-sponsored insurance allows them to keep the network of, of physicians and providers that they're comfortable with. So we want to be helpful in that process. Uh, certainly, a social safety net is important. Whether people choose to go to Medicaid, they choose to go to the exchanges, or choose to keep their COBRA, we think it's important that we are uh, fostering a, a public policy that that provides that level of support. For, for a period of time that, that, that gives them to that, that bridge to that next job. 
So you have um, state teams that are working in community and, and, and state coalitions to both support uh, support for the COBRA payments um, for uh, beneficiaries who've lost insurance, as well as enrolling individuals in the insurance exchanges to make sure that they have that desirable insurance. Dr. Perlin, so the, in, in the last CARES bill, there's a, something called Section 5001 uh, dollars. And that was about $150 billion that went to the states. And those dollars can be used for pretty much anything COVID related. And you know, it could be used for you know, education purposes, to buy laptops for kids. It could be used for Im important healthcare policies. Uh, we would like to see some of those dollars, not all of them, of course, but some of those dollars uh, applied to, to provide a bit of a social safety net for in healthcare, well, whether that is on, to provide some uh, assistance for uh, coverage subsidies, uh, perhaps help with uh, their nursing homes in terms of their PPE acquisitions, maybe prescription drug assistance. So we would like to see part of that uh, money used for that. And so we are uh, partnering, uh, our government affairs state teams are partnering uh, with the physician community there and other uh, stakeholders in the business community to, to try to get that done. You know, some things have really changed practice. Uh, some of us um, have been using telehealth for a long time, but um, I, all of a sudden, it's not my kids who are using telehealth, it's my parents who are using telehealth. Uh, is that genie going back in the bottle, or do you think um, this has given both the executive and regulatory um, uh, mechanism, as well as the legislative, the sort of ammunition to, to build this into part of the woodwork for the future of, um, uh, of reimbursement for healthcare anyway? Yeah, you know, Dr. Perlin, I think you said it best. Uh, we have, in a matter of three short months, completely upended the way healthcare has been delivered, uh, which is in a remote fashion, largely. And so, no, I don't believe that telehealth can be put back in that bottle. I think the question now is is the, you know, sort of regulating and legislating around the edges. Uh, consumers really liked it. I think uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, benefits to the healthcare system during this period of time of people not having to go uh, to, to uh, you know, to places where they felt they didn't, they didn't feel comfortable going. So I think that uh, it is something that will, we're, it's here to stay. And I think the only question is, when do they formalize the structure? What needs regulation? What needs legislation? And it also is really wrapped up into the end of the public health emergency. Right now, the, uh, it's sort of status quo uh, you know, with the with the current telehealth structure, uh, you know, in the COVID environment, once that is over, once the public health emergency is over, then there'll be a quick decision of, you know, what do we have to do to make sure it doesn't go back in that bottle? I've been around long enough to know that typically uh, policymakers don't act until they have to. And so it's not, in my opinion, likely that they're going to rush to uh, figure out that construct uh, before they have to. So we could be in this public health emergency for some time. Uh, you know, we could end tomorrow, but also it could go on for another year. So uh, I would think that this is going to play out over over the coming months. I appreciate the um, the insight on the telehealth. Um, I indeed, you know, one of the big challenges is managing the virtual patient load uh, with the physical patient load, and um, being paid for the virtual patient load is, I think, appropriate, and ultimately creates a dynamic that in the clinically appropriate circumstances, bring the patients back to the office uh, or uh, the hospital or the ambulatory surgical center or, or, or wherever. There are um, a, a number of other uh, dynamics uh, as well at play. Uh, the politicians want to make sure that um, uh, they don't uh, end up in a public health emergency crisis that's unmanageable. And so they're watching, can hospitals simultaneously care for patients with COVID uh, as well as uh, meet the needs um, uh, of patients who don't have COVID. Ironically, um, you know, a lot of things that us clinicians would not think are elastic, acute coronary syndrome, stroke, et cetera, suppressed 30 to 40 plus percent uh, in different markets, EMS showing up uh, to patients who are really um, uh, in extremis uh, at, at, at the scene. Uh, we want to bring patients back. And so I, I, you've been helping uh, our um, our colleagues across the country really articulate to our state and national leaders uh, that we're going to have to manage through this because we don't know how long COVID goes on, so we have to coexist with COVID for the foreseeable future. Any, any thoughts on that topic? You're, yes, Dr. Perlin, you're right. Coexisting here is how I think we need to, we need to think about this. This isn't uh, going away anytime soon, even as you know with the vaccine, 
it's not likely that we're going to all of a sudden produce 300 billion uh, vaccines, uh, uh, you know, shipments out there for everyone to have. So this is going to be a situation where uh, once the vaccine is available, it's going to have to be staged. And that means people are going to need to continue to access the healthcare system with COVID in the environment. We need to make sure that patients feel safe. We need to make sure that patients, uh, you know, in our communities, uh, access the health care when they need the health care. And uh, we, there are some troubling signs that people are delaying care and they're getting, uh, they're getting worse as a result of it and coming in later. And, and that is absolutely not the incentive we need right now. So we are uh, doing our best at this point to communicate to, to policymakers uh, that, that uh, we, have, we are prepared. I think that uh, one thing that is, if there's a lesson learned in this process is that we now know how to stage electives. We now know what uh, PPE we need. We know what we need to have on hand, how to scale up and scale down. So we are prepared. We feel good about our preparation and we are doing our best to communicate that to uh, the governors and the mayors and others. Uh, but you know, you're right, we're gonna have to live with this uh, uh, for some time. And it really is about the patients, making sure that they feel comfortable and know that we have a plan in place to meet their needs. Well, we appreciate your advocacy. And uh, I think the other thing that obviously is influencing the political landscape at the moment is that there's an election coming up. Uh, and uh, maybe in closing, any, any, any comments on the sort of collision of uh, the usual sort of dynamics of uh, an election with uh, everything else that's going on? It certainly makes for interesting times. You know, it's, it's uh, I'm one of those kind of people that uh, I'm, a, I'm a poll, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a poll freak. I love looking at polls every morning. I pick up my phone and see the latest polls that are out there, even though, even though we all know uh, that you really you can't put any weight into polls until, you know, the poll on on Election Day. Uh, and that is and that is the one that really matters. That being said, uh, you know, there's a lot of implications for the next election as implications uh, on on healthcare delivery, there's implications on tax policy. There's implications really on on, on everything and, and every way we live. And so, yeah, it is a, a lot sort of colliding in this moment. Uh, and even accessing the polls is an issue. Uh, accessing the the voting booth is going to be is going to be an issue, and I think a political one. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the polls today out this morning uh, certainly uh, uh, tell a consistent tale. Of, of where uh, things seem to be heading, but we do live in unpredictable times. And so I'm just gonna stay tuned and, uh, and, and see what happens as we get to November 3rd. Well, we really appreciate that you're up there in Washington advocating for uh, all of the physicians and clinicians and bedside care providers who are part of the HCI family. Uh, we, we thank you for that. And um, uh, we don't have to wear masks here in the same room, we'll be six feet apart. Uh, we're <laughs> enjoying the new normal here. Uh, and um, we keep in contact pretty frequently, um, uh, more than once daily, I would say, on, on these matters as, as the clinical and the political uh, and the governmental intersect. We're, we're really fortunate, Jeff Cohen, to have you as a member of the team. We thank you. Uh, and I know you join me in thanking all of the clinicians, the care providers, the physicians that are part of the HCI family and are managing in this extraordinarily complex uh, environment, caring for COVID, non-COVID, uh, and uh, everything else. Uh, and uh, that's why we bring you a physician's lens. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.